First of all, the taxonomy. When we looked at them, all these large domic colonies were the same form. They were all stigmatella personality. These are the large zoesia. This is where the, the feeding uh, tubes would be. And you'd have had a, a loaf of four, uh, a polypied at the top. So they're very straight. And here in cross-section, they're polygonal. There's no um, polymorphs here. There's no sort of structural um, tubes here. There was two examples where we saw two other trepostomes. Uh, this one's a monticulipara. And in both cases, they were overgrown by um, stigmatella, these large domic structures. You can tell this one's different because it has smaller polymorphs in it, and it has these cystose diaphragms running all the way down the, uh, the autosuicial tubes. So looking at the morphology, we looked at those growing up. The first sections that we actually cut open, we thought there was a difference because the ones growing up seem to have these sort of quite thin, um, smaller dirt colonies, whereas the ones beneath seem to be much more domy. But the more colonies we cut open, it's evened it up, and it seems to be that the, the shape didn't seem to matter whether they were growing up or down. <coughs> we then looked at the diaphragm spacing. Again, when we first looked at it, it seems to be that the diaphragms on the ones growing up were much closer spaced than the ones growing down. But actually, this was, again, a function of the sample size. Once you start to look at the samples, the ones growing down also had multiple diaphragms. And we measured diaphragms throughout the colonies. And it seemed to be where the diaphragms were most uh, distal, you got them most closely spaced together. The one thing there was a slight difference in was autosuicial length. The ones growing down seemed to be longer. And you can see they had incredibly long autosuicial lo lengths coming down. We did have small sample size, and we can't go and collect again, so it, this may be just sample size, but it did seem to reflect this. And this might be why the, the diaphragms also looked closer together, because we're getting a lot of zoesial tube without many diaphragms, and towards the top you start getting the diaphragms. The actual colonies are grown by intercolonial growths, so when you look at them, you can see layers growing into them. And here we have the layers of the bryzone, but they're actually all one colony. It's the colony overgrowing itself. And so they're formed by overgrowth, and you can see that they're intercol intercolonial because here you've got the long colonies uninterrupted, but here the actual colony begins to overgrow itself in this part and again in this portion here. Now, zooids in the older part of the colony would have dead when they were overgrown. You don't generally get the colonies overgrowing the live cells. So parts of the colony would have died, and then to retain this domic form, the colony would have overgrown itself. But the overgrowths are strange. They're marked by sediment infilling the zoesial tubes in the older parts of the colony. So along here, you can see sediment in the tops of the autosuicial tubes and then overgrown, and again here, overgrown by this part of the colony. Now, it's unlikely that the influx of sediment killed the parts of the colony by smothering because bryzones are quite adept at removing the sediment off the colony. There's been descriptions where the, the loaf of itself was swept across the colony and removed sediment. But it's strange that the sediment's actually retained on the colony surface, especially for those that are growing downwards, because you'd have thought gravity itself would have dislodged these parts. So what we're suggesting is that dead parts of the colonies <coughs> may have been covered in biofilms, and this sediment would have attached itself to the bio surface of the biofilm, trapped it in there, and then the colony would have overgrown itself across here. So we're actually learning more about what the organic content and organic organisms present it within the colonies are. <coughs> You also get information about uh, showing that there's differences in environmental effects in the colony growth. A lot of the time you can see long straight zoysia growing down with no changes, but every now and then you get slight differences. And in Paleozoic bryzoans, these differences often <coughs> indicate environmental problems. Here you've got relatively thick walls suddenly becoming thin and then thicker and developing these calcite rods, these styles, in the place where you've got uh, environmental change. Because sometimes in bryzones, when it's environmentally stressed, you'll get a species which normally doesn't present any diaphragms at all. With environmental stress, suddenly diaphragms are produced very rapidly. So we think something must have been going on here to disturb it. The colonies are bored. Very bored. You can see here all the borings coming through them. And here's one of the, the borings. Now, bryzones produce, uh, provide a substrate for macroboring organisms, especially during the middle and upper Ordovician. Uh, the Ordovician radiation of bryzone diversity probably contributed to the diversification of macro ichnophore taxa at this time. This has actually been termed the Ordovician bioerosion revolution by Mark Wilson and Tim Palmer. When you look at some bryzones in Estonia of this age, up to 80% of the colonies can be bored, so you've actually hardly got anything left of the actual colony. And you look at parts of this, 
and it's just completely bored. Now with the borings, they're all straight and cylindrical, so they're all identified as tripinites. When you see them on the surface of the rock, they're very much circular, um, and they just look like straight tubes. However, two types have been recognised. We've got two levels of boring, probably created by different animals. The first one is smaller. It's infilled with dolomite and micrite, and it's confined to a sil single overgrowth within the bryozoan colony. You don't find any fossil fragments in them, but we do find ghosts, which I'll explain soon. So here are the borings, and you can see the colony's overgrown over the top of the boring in both cases. You don't get them penetrating between the two levels. Now, in actual shape, on the surface, um, if you think the surface of the colony, when you looked at the surface, they looked circular. Um, if they were circular like this, it would suggest that you, you, the actual boring is going through some kind of uniform medium. But when you actually look at the, in the thin sections at the borings, you've actually got a polygonal shape, and they follow around the walls of the autozoecia, so you've got irregular polygonal shapes here. So what you'd be getting is this sort of shape. And so the excavating, this, this so-called cylindrical cavity, is actually parallel to the walls. And this was obviously the way of least resistance for the borer. And it shows that, although we had rapid sedimentation, uh, rapid calcification at this time, these weren't calcified, and these were still holes, so it was able to bore within this way. And this is the same uh, has been found also in Estonia at this time. But we do find ghosts in these, these white, uh, clear, cylindrical tubes of calcite surrounded by micrite. Now the ghosts are defined as this, this smaller sparry calcite voids with the larger micrite filled borings, and they've been interpreted as a cast of the boring organism. It's possibly killed by the infilling of matrix when the larger boring was excavated, and this matrix might have occurred during a storm vent. We're obviously getting sediment onto these colonies because we're getting sediment stuck to these biofilms. As the borings decayed, you'd have got a void, and this would have been uh, left for the matrix filling uh, boring, and this was filled by diagenetic sparite. It's first identified in Estonia, um, in this one here of a <coughs> sanctum boring, and again a tripinitis and oblique one here. But when you look at it in these ones, it's very common in all these tubes, and they're usually always cylindrical, whereas the actual boring around here is much more polygonal in shape. <coughs> Now, the larger type, B boring, is, is bigger. It's infilled with dolomite and silt, and it cuts across the overgrowths. So you can see here you've got four layers of overgrowth, and the actual thing's cutting right across. And you find fossil fragments inside. So it shows that there are other fossils, uh, other bryozoans around, because you're getting bits of cryptostome preserved here, and other bits of uh, trepostome bryozoans, which weren't stigmatella. So it gives an idea of other fauna in this area. Here's the comparison. It's a comparison of the two kinds. We've got the large, large boring here and the smaller one here with micrite and the ghost inside. We've also got evidence of bioclostration. This is when you've got a soft-bodied organism that lands on the bryozoan colony, and the bryozoan colony will actually, the walls will actually grow around it. So we've got the walls thickened here and growing around something that's on the colony. We can't tell what it is, um, possibly some kind of worm structures on it. So we'd have got some things preserved by bioclostration, other things would have been perhaps transient on the colonies as well. And you can see it's possibly caused some kind of stress to the colony because you're getting calcite rods growing out here as well. And you're getting a real disturbance around this area. Now, the one thing we didn't manage to find in these colonies was, any, was much in the way of organic remains. The, the great thing about the Cincinnati and bryozoans is you do find evidence of the actual um, the feeding structures within them. This is another colony from the Cincinnati, but not this area. <coughs> and you've got evidence here of the orifice and bits of perhaps the digestive tract here. We did find some evidence that possibly might be organic remains. These small sort of triangles, dark triangles, which are resting on diaphragms, these look like they might be degraded polypides left in the tubes. Um, when these are analysed in other structures, they come out as um, autogenic clays. And we think these are caught, these are sort of those brown bodies, so I think they're sort of deteriorated polypides left, but there's none of this actual structure that you get in other ones. So just a summary, these cave-dwelling bryozoans, although bryozoans very much try to you know, maximise to get the, um, major, the water currents, there were little differentiated between their exposed and uh, counter exposed counterparts. So growing down into the cave didn't seem to make any difference. They grew just as fast and they grew just as big. The colonies generally grew by self-overgrowth, and it's self-overgrowth that actually um, shows us a lot of other features. 
So whereas on the hand specimens, all you see are just a bryzone growing on a, a, a bare, back, back, bare surface of the rock, what you're actually getting is a bryzone which has been bored by several different types of animals. You've got biofilms growing on the uh, fauna as well, and a soft-bodied fauna which would have been living on the bryzones and obviously on the rock around. So just by looking at these small specimens, you get an idea of the paleoecology of this area. Thanks very much.